We've just passed the one-year anniversary of the horrific Las Vegas shooting. New details are starting to emerge on what transpired during that tragic night. One America's Jack Posobiec sits down with a former CIA officer to talk about that investigation. We're here with Brad Johnson, Americans for Intelligence Reform. Thank you so much for coming back on. One of the last times we had you on, we did our big 30-minute Las Vegas special, and we're doing an update today. More information. We've got the full report. You've been going through it. You've done some more of your own looking into this, your own analysis. What have you got for us? And thanks for coming back. Jack, so nice to, have, to see you again and great to be here. Yes, we're just on the heels of the one-year anniversary of the shooting in Las Vegas, the mass shooting in Las Vegas, and also the final police report has come out. And there's a number of interesting things in there that have been sort of glossed over that are worth bringing to everyone's attention. One of them is a uh, within the body of the reports that the police collected, that law enforcement collected during this, was a report by a young lady who is a DHS, TSA employee, so Department of Homeland Security, TSA, which are the folks at the airport. So she's got training that, that is clearly apparent in her report. Now, I've reached out to the young lady that did this, and she's asked me not to use her name, so I will not, but uh, she was, a, 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 as you noticed, a, a trained federal employee who happened to be there and observed something very interesting. In the official police report, the final report that just came out, they stated that no evidence exists to indicate Paddock conspired with or acted in collusion with anyone else. Right. No evidence exists. That's their, their, their claim. Now, at 9.20 p.m., this is when this TSA woman observed this to take place. She gives a very nicely detailed report. She describes two women at the back of the concert. The two women are standing on top of the bale of hay and where they have a good vantage point to look down on the backs of the crowd facing towards the performer. She, the first woman says, those stupid effing white people, they are gonna know how it feels, they deserve this, wait until later. And this is about a half hour before the shooting begins. The second woman, woohoo, like shooting fish in a barrel, are you getting this baby, I love you. Now the woman that says, are you getting this baby, is standing with her phone, live streaming from the back of the concert, what's going on. Now, while that is not conclusive proof, it's decidedly suspicious and has not been followed up on. Now, a couple of other things that, that, that came out of that, and one of them I want to go to next since we're kind of on the timeline issue. So this takes place at 21.20, 9.20 p.m., uh, and now during that period, there's no information as to what Stephen Paddock, the shooter, was doing in that room. Now, he was already located in the room from, from where the shooting took place at 32135, and 32134, the two rooms that he used. And he's building up his barricades now in these rooms. Correct. He's clearly in the final stages of preparing to start shooting. So at 2136, so at 936, which is what, 16 minutes or so after this bale of hay incident, he throws the deadbolt. Now this is all kept track of by the hotel, so they see when rooms are accessed and when the deadbolt is thrown on their on their in-house computer system. And we've got the door access security program. Exactly right. So at 2136, he throws the deadbolt to 32135. Now this is very important. Ten minutes go by. In the middle of those ten minutes, the concert begins. Now as we've discussed before, there was these were connecting rooms. 32135 and 32134 were connecting with an interior door. So the 135 door was not opened. Precisely 10 minutes later, the deadbolt was thrown to 134. So for, that's from the inside. So that is absolute conclusive proof of, with no doubt whatsoever, because 1235, uh, 32135 was not opened again, that that interior door was used to throw the deadbolt on 134, or there was a second person in there to do it. There is no other way. So that interior door, fast forward a, a half hour or so after the shooting, Paddock's dead. The police breach the door to 32135, find Paddock's dead body. They themselves, the police, could not get into 134. They tried to kick through the door, couldn't do it, and had to breach the door so that they could enter 134. That deadbolt on the passage door between the two rooms was deadbolted from the 134 side. Now we know that prior to the shooting, that door either had to be opened so that Paddock could go through and lock the 134 door to the hallway, or somebody else was in that room. It has to be one of the two. There's no other way. That has to be investigated and followed up on. Now in that room too, another interesting point out of all of that, two computers were found. One of those computers had a, a, a uh, 
uh, the hard drive missing. That was removed from it. Well, why would you bring a laptop to the room to do a shooting that already had that hard drive removed? That doesn't make sense. So it's logical that that was removed at the time and somebody took it away. That, that, I mean, I, it's hard to prove things like that, but it's an interesting little side aspect. Well, if, I mean, if, if he knew that he was going to conduct the attack, then obviously he was willing to give himself up, so why try to protect himself if he knew he was doing that? Exactly. It just makes no sense for this to have played out that way. So there's a lot of questions. I mean, to make the statement in the police report that there's no evidence is a falsehood. There's clearly evidence, and, and the evidence wasn't followed up on. And let me uh, come back to one other point that we've discussed previously, and that's Brian Hodges. The Australian that in the several hours following this, the mass shooting claimed to have been in room 32134. And this is via uh, multiple social media posts that were made then following up on that because of those posts. Uh, he was interviewed numerous times on mostly Australian uh, media and during those interviews claimed that he was in that room. Correct. That had, that had been his room. Radio and television interviews that he later did that were in Australia. Now an interesting point out of all that, he claims to be have been in room uh, 32134. In room 32134 were another pair of gloves found. These were initially reported in the, in the initial police report, but were not reported on. That's been dropped out of the final police report. Now, interesting aspect. Now Paddock himself, when his body was found, had gloves on. So what were those second pair of gloves doing? And they weren't brand new gloves unused that are like smashed down from packing. These are gloves that had had hands in them and then were dropped on the bed in room one, one, 32134. Mm -hmm. So uh, interesting, interesting, but certainly evidence of a second person being there. I don't see how you describe that as any other way than it, evidence. Is it conclusive? No. But you start stacking these things up and there's a lot of questions that are not answered as to this mass shooting with 58 dead people and over 800 wounded according to the final police report. Still the largest mass shooting in American history. Ever. And obviously the families of all those who lost loved ones in this want some kind of closure and want some answers and this report isn't giving them very much. It is not giving them what they need. This closure cannot take place until all of these things you and I are talking about are run down. Another final area out of all of this that's kind of that, that's kind of interesting on this is how the police source some of the information. It's come out that they, they, they cannot identify a motive and that they don't think it's political. But two things I want to say about that. One, Paddock started buying all these guns that he used in the shooting when Trump was elected and over the eight months or so put all of this arsenal together which he used during the shooting. An interesting quirk of timing f that, that is not given any significance. The, and the concert itself, too, was widely regarded as, as a country, it was a country western uh, concert that was widely regarded as being full of Trump supporters. Whether that's true or not doesn't matter. It was still regarded that way. And uh, very reasonable for Paddock to have regarded it that way as well. So the source that says that, that Stephen Paddock was not political is his girlfriend, Mary Lou Danley. That's the source. Now, the police referenced his family members, but all of them had been estranged from him for mostly for more than a decade. So they didn't know and said in their reports they didn't know. So the source of the information saying he was non-political was only Mary Lou Danley, who was widely believed to be the more radical leftist of the two. Now, another very interesting point about Mary Lou Danley. We've talked about Brian Hodges and how he claimed to be in the room, the shooter's room, 32134. He was at least on that floor as a guest in his own right and was supposed to have been checked into 32129, which 32 designates floor, 1 indicates the hallway, and then his room was 29 and it was 34 and 35. So he was very near where the shooting took place. Why would he have not been questioned just anyway, but he was not, having been somebody supposedly on that floor, and then later to have claimed to have been in the room. So Brian Hodges is Australian. Brian Hodges claimed in his own information talking about himself, he claimed at one time to have worked in a casino called the Star Casino, Star Gold Coast Casino, which is located at Gold Coast in Australia. Now very interesting, Mary Lou Danley, who's been widely reported to have also been a dealer at the casino also said about herself that she previously worked in the Star Gold Coast Casino. Now, I dutifully looked up the, the Star Gold Coast Casino, and it's in an area of Australia called Gold Coast, and there's precisely one casino there, and that's the Star Casino. 
There are no, there are other casinos a half hour away and things like that, but that's the only casino in that location. Now, for Brian Hodges and Mary Lou Danley, who both claim to have worked there in the same period of time, they would have known each other. It's a small family of dealers that are there, and they all know each other from their shifts and so on. It would have been very difficult for them not to have at least known each other by sight, at the very minimum. And then later, interesting, Brian Hodges shows up where Mary, Dan Mary Lou Danley is then now dating uh, Stephen Paddock. So that's never been investigated either. How can, even to this day, we be at the situation where Brian Hodges has not been questioned by authorities? How can that be? He's just, there's just too many links to the shooting for him not to be questioned. Brad, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you so much for giving us this sort of one year update uh, as far as the anniversary goes. And I, I certainly appreciate it, the network appreciates it. And I'm hopefully that as we drive towards the truth on this, it'll lead to closure for those that were affected by this horrific tragedy. I pray that takes place. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Want to see more videos like this? Click on the link below and subscribe to One American News on YouTube and call your cable provider and kindly demand that One American News is added to your lineup. Call and subscribe today.